Good day and welcome to the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials FAB Domain 6 webinar series. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Ms. Jamie Ishkomer, Senior Analyst of Quality Improvement and Performance Management. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. On behalf of the Association of the State and Territorial Health Officials, aka AFTO, I would like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar entitled Enforcing and Providing Education on Public Health Laws for FAB Accreditation. This is the third and final webinar as part of AFTO's Public Health Accreditation Board's Domain 6 Public Health Laws webinar series. My name is Jamie Ishcomer. I'm a Senior Analyst of Quality Improvement and Performance Management at AFTO and will be moderating today's session. For those that may not be familiar with AFTO, AFTO is a national nonprofit organization representing public health agencies in the United States, the U.S. territories, and the District of Columbia, and over 100,000 public health professionals that these agencies employ. AFTO's vision is state and territorial health agencies advancing health equity and optimal health for all. Our mission is to support, equip, and advocate for state and territor ter territorial health officials in their work of advancing the public's health and well-being. Today's webinar is brought to you through funding and partnership between AFTO and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, proposed Center for State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support. The content of this webinar are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position or endorsement by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Before we begin, here are a few quick notes on logistics for today's webinar. First, all lines are muted and will remain muted for the remainder of the call. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. Questions can be entered into the chat box. And if the question is for a specific individual, please indicate who that question is for. If you're sharing a conference room or other computer with others, please use the, use the chat box to provide each person's name, organization, and email address to ensure that they receive future announcements regarding the webinar series, such as a web webinar recording. There will be a brief evaluation at the conclusion of this webinar. We ask that you please take a minute to complete this as it helps AFTO ensure our own continuous quality improvement. Finally, today's materials, including the webinar, will be available within the next week. All registered attendees should have already received an email with the slides in the uh, slides for today's webinar, as well as um, a notification when the, uh, when the recording will be posted. Here's a quick look at what you can expect from today's webinar. I will quickly introduce each of our presenters before turning it over to them. And then we'll first hear from Leah Silva with ASTO on an overview of FAB Domain 6, Standard 6.2 and 6.3. We'll hear from Shelley Bruce with Wisconsin on enforcing and providing education on public health laws to others. And then Don Hunter from New Mexico will be presenting on partnerships for public health enforcement. And again, we'll have time for questions at the very end of today's webinar via the chat box. Before we begin, I'd like to present each of our presenters. First, we'll have Shelley Bruce, who's been with the Lead and Asbestos Program in the Washington Department of Health Services, Division of Public Health since 1995, and is currently the Section Chief of the Lead and Asbestos Section. During her 23 years with the division, she has gained extensive knowledge of state and federal regulations related to lead and asbestos and their importance to protecting the health and safety of workers, occupants, and the public. She oversaw extensive revisions to the department's administrative rules for asbestos in 2009, ensuring coverage of all rental housing insulation as an asbestos-containing material. In 2010, she also oversaw the development and implementation of the Lead Safe Renovation Rules for Wisconsin, becoming the first EPA-authorized Lead Safe Renovation State Program in the country. We'll also hear from John Hunter, who is the Deputy Cabinet Secretary for the New Mexico Department of Health. In this role, she has oversight of four program areas, including public health, epidemiology and response, the state laboratory, and health facilities licensing and oversight. John is the former, public, the former policy director and continues to oversee the policy office. John first joined the New Mexico Department of Health as a visiting attorney in the public health law through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Visiting Attorney Program. Prior to this, John was a microbiologist in the Advanced Biosensors Lab 
in the Center for Biological Defense at the University of South Florida, where she specialized in researching and developing biosensor assays for rapid, rapid detection of food and waterborne pathogens. Dawn also has experience in residential foster care, child, protect, child protective services, and foster care adoptions. Dawn has an AB in English Literature from Princeton University, a BS in Microbiology, and an MPH in Global Communicable, Communicable Disease from the University of South Florida, and a JV from Stetson University of Law. She's a member of the Florida Bar and certified in public health by the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Finally, we have Leah Silva from ASTO. Leah Silva joined ASTO in 2016 and serves as the Director of State and Territorial Performance Improvement. In this position, Leah works with territorial and freely associated state health agencies to strengthen the public health infrastructure and build agency capacity. Leah manages ASTO's relationships with external partners in the Pacific and Atl Atlantic and coordinates all of ASTO's programmatic work with the territories and freely associated states. Leah is responsible for the content design and implementation of product deliverables around business process improvement, strategic planning, performance management, quality improvement, and accreditation readiness in the territories and for the associated states. Prior to joining ASTO, Leah was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Public Health Law Fellow at the Minnesota Department of Health. She earned her BA in Political Science from the George Washington University and her law degree from Penn State Law. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter, Leah Silva. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I'm going to go into some detail on our uh, standard 6.2 and 6.3, which is the focus of today's webinar. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to share one thing about enforcement. Um, and this is a question that we get um, at ASTO from state health agencies often, is what to do if your health agency is not responsible for enforcement activities. So FAB recognizes that enforcement is not always the responsibility of the health department. So even if your health agency does not do enforcement activities, the health agency is still responsible for sharing information and following up as appropriate with those agencies or organizations that are responsible for enforcement. So we're really thinking about coordination and information sharing here. Your health agency must be able to identify patterns and trends and engage in health education with the population. And the way you do this is through monitoring enforcement activities, information sharing, and coordinating notifications of violations with those agencies or organizations that are responsible for enforcement. So this is a challenge that comes up often. We've, again, we've received this questions many times. And as I go through some of these standards, um, we will, we'll get into this and some examples or, or options for you if your agency is not solely responsible for enforcement activities. So to get into some more details, standard 6.2 is educate individuals and organizations on the meaning, purpose, and benefit of public health laws and how to comply. So educational efforts should be aimed at individuals and organizations that are a part of the jurisdiction served. So this could include schools, civic organizations, human service organizations, and other government units or agencies. In addition, education efforts must be culturally and linguistically appropriate to the audience. And this is a theme that comes up throughout accreditation with health equity um, and addressing health disparities as well. Measure 6.2.1 and Standard 6.2 assesses the health agency's knowledge of how laws support public health practice and their efforts to ensure that these measures, measures are applied consistently. So within this measure, there are two requirements. First, the health agency must train staff in laws that support public health interventions and practice. And training can be general or include specific aspects of public health law. However, staff must be trained on the specific aspects of the law for which they are programmatically responsible. Second, the health agency must ensure that the consistent application of public health laws. Essentially, health agencies should show that they have reviewed its staff's application of laws or other organizations' application of public health laws if the agency is not resp responsible for enforcement. Measure 6.2.2 assesses the health agency's provision of information to the public concerning public health-related permits and applications. If the health agency is not responsible for these requirements or applications, it should be sufficiently informed to guide or advise the public and then direct them to the responsible agency. Information can be made available through the health agency's website or provided to the public in a paper document, for example, a pamphlet, a flyer, um, or something of that nature. Measure 6.2.3 assesses the health agency's education of regulated entities, so those entities that are responsible for complying with laws that have a public health impact. Information provided to regulated entities concerning their responsibilities for compliance could be provided to a targeted group. So for example, public schools with, which enforce immunization requirements 
or it may be to the entire population. So for example, the entire population, including parents who are responsible for having their children get the appropriate vaccinations. Moving on to standard 6.3, which is conduct and monitor public health enforcement activities and coordinate notification of violations among appropriate agencies. So standard 6.3 has quite a few measures that are very much directed at enforcement activities specifically. Again, the same principles apply when the health agencies do not have enforcement activities. So the role of the health agency in these situations is to collaborate, assist, and share information with those who have enforcement authority. Health agencies do need to know about enforcement activities and violations in their jurisdictions and are responsible for follow-up communication and education on uh, public health implications of any violations or any complaints. They must also be informed of non-compliance. Health agencies may also provide may also be able to provide advice concerning enforcement. So if the health agent or the agencies that are responsible for enforcement are not familiar with the public health implications, it's important for the health agency to share that information. So we'll take a closer look at the five measures in this standard. Measure 6.3.1 states that health agencies must have written procedures and protocols for conducting enforcement actions. Within, their, within this measure, there are two requirements. First, the health agency must document its authority to conduct enforcement activities, whether it's in the state code, local code, contract, or regulations, just to name a few. When a health agency has no authority to conduct enforcement actions, the health agency can provide documentation of authority of another entity with which it coordinates and shares information. So again, it may not be within your enforcement authority, but you can show that it's within someone else's and that you coordinate with them. Second, health agency must have procedures and protocols for achieving compliance with laws or enforcement actions. Again, where the health agency does not have enforcement authority here, protocols used by the enforcement agency should be provided and the protocol must demonstrate cooperation between the enforcement agency and the health department. So you're seeing a theme and a pattern here. Measure 6.3.2 requires that inspection activities or regulated entities be conducted and monitored according to mandated frequency and or risk analysis methods that guides the frequency and scheduling of inspections of regulated entities. So it's very wordy. Essentially, this measure is assessing the health agency's adherence to guidelines on the frequency of inspection activities. Where inspections are conducted by other agencies, which might be the case, the health agency should be notified of those inspections protocols, and status. This will allow the health agency to provide follow-up education and communication to protect the public's health. There must also be a protocol or algorithm for scheduling inspections of regulated entities. Often this might be specified in law, but where that's not the case, the health agency can develop a method to define an appropriate schedule. Health agencies must also document a database or log of inspection reports with actions taken, current status, follow-up, reinspections, and final disposition. So measure 6.3.3 assesses the health agency's implementation of procedures and protocols for routine or emergency enforcement activities and for follow-up of complaints. Standard procedures ensure that investigations and follow-up are conducted appropriately and in a timely manner. The health agency must show actions taken as a result of investigations or follow-up of complaints as well as an analysis of the situation and standards for follow-up. The health agency must also document hearings, meetings, or any other form of communications with regulated entities regarding a complaint and resulting compliance plan. Measure 6.3.4 assesses the health agency's analysis of patterns, trends, and compliance from enforcement activities and complaint investigations. This will help in understanding the prevalence of issues employing preventative measures, pursuing opportunities for improvement in enforcement activities, and providing follow-up education. So again, we're talking about quality improvement here um, and being a little bit more proactive. The health agency must provide annual reports that summarize complaints, enforcement activities, or compliance, and the reports must include patterns or trends. The health agencies must conduct debriefings or other evaluations to evaluate what worked well, problems that arose, issues and recommended changes in investigation or response procedures and other process improvements to enforce our protocols. So again, this is really going to the theme of accreditation, which is all about continuous quality improvement. Finally, measure 6.3.5 assesses the health agency's communication with the public concerning enforcement activities, follow-up activities, and trends or patterns. It is important that the public has appropriate and timely information to make informed decisions or alter their behavior. 
Also important that health agencies share information about enforcement actions and follow up with other agencies responsible for educating the regulated entity or the public. First, the health agency must have a communication protocol for interagency notifications. There must also be a protocol for notifying the public. Third, the health department must provide staff with documentation of the implementation of a protocol, and the documentation must show that the protocol was followed. So while you have these protocols in place, the last part of this measure is talking about um, showing an example of how you put that protocol into practice. So I know that was a very high level um, overview and I ran through that very quickly. Fortunately, our speakers today will provide some examples of how they met these standards and measures. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Jamie. Thank you so much, Leah, for providing that overview. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Shelley Bruce, the Chief Sled and Assessment Section of the Wisconsin Division of Public Health, who will now talk to you how Wisconsin has um, enforced and provided education on public health laws. Take it away, Shelley. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I just want to say uh, that my presentation today is going to cover our recent, our very recent experience um, in providing the evidence for standards uh, 6.2 and 6.3. We're, uh, we're still in the accreditation process here in Wisconsin, but we have gone through our uh, site visit. So that's where we're at. And some of you may be at the same point or um, maybe much earlier in the process. Uh, so we've spent the past two plus years working on this domain and reviewing and determining what we would use for examples. And in doing so, um, it certainly became very important that we expanded our understanding of what enforcement is and the breadth and scope of the evidence that we would, would look for and use. So as we get going today, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about the Division of Public Health here in Wisconsin to give you some background information. Uh, the Division of Public Health in Wisconsin resides in the Department of Health Services, so we're not a complete department of our own, but we're within another uh, larger agency. And our governing entity is the Secretary of the Department of Health Services. Wisconsin is a home rule state, which means that local health departments provide most of the direct community public health services in the state and do some of the enforcement activity as well. The department and the Division of Public Health provide services and resources and oversight to the local health departments but they do have home rule and uh, even when we provide them with money, they can turn the money down if they don't choose to take that program. The division also provides statewide surveillance, tracking, outreach, and enforcement of public health laws for those areas where the local health departments do not have the authority or have chosen not to um, become a delegate agency for us. The Wisconsin Division of Public Health has five bureaus and three offices, and this became important for us as we were putting together our domain teams that would work on um, providing the evidence. And when we started uh, and our team was developed, we initially only had uh, people on our domain team from the Environmental and Occupational Health Bureau from the health informatics and the preparedness and emergency health care offices. We also had an attorney from the department's office of legal counsel. But we didn't have representation, and this turned out to be important for us. We did not have representation from communicable disease or from community health promotion, which um, includes our smoking, um, injury prevention, and uh, chronic disease um, sections. So as it turned out, those became important for us in looking for evidence, but initially it was difficult to pull people from those bureaus because um, many of them felt they were already working on the other domains and didn't feel that enforcement was their area. Wisconsin's accreditation journey, we'll move to the next, thank you. Um, 
Really, as I mentioned before, we just went through our site visit uh, just over two weeks ago on May 7th and 8th, and we won't know our outcome for a few months. But um, I think we still learned a lot of lessons, and, I, and we are hopeful that most of our uh, evidence will at least get uh, largely, um, largely shown or fully shown. Um, I'm sure there will be some that will be slightly, and let's hope we have none that, that aren't uh, accepted at all. But being uh, well prepared be, was a very important thing. We did bring in outside consultation. Um, we did a lot of preparation. We did a practice site visit about three weeks before the actual one. All of those were very important and really helped us solidify how we approached um, presenting our evidence and having the right membership on the domain team. It took us, it, it, with Domain 6, about a year to really establish that we needed additional people to help. Um, in the next slide, um, in looking at what we ended up using, um, I believe we're one slide ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, we ended up using a lot of programs that we have um, that have enforcement pieces to them that are well within our own agency. But I've listed here several other areas that are outside of our agency. They may reside with the Department of Natural Resources or the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection or with local health departments. The areas that we ended up using mostly were the lead and asbestos certification programs. Those are my programs and we're a direct regulatory program, so that was fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, infectious disease reporting, radiation licensing, um, and that included mammography and x-ray. Um, immunization um, for schools and uh, vaccines for children were two programs we used out of the immunization program. And the sales of tobacco to youth as well, we, we used the um, tobacco prevention program as well. Next slide. Um, so basically in Wisconsin we have those programs that are directly enforced by our health department, the state health department, and we have those that are indirectly enforced and generally through other health departments or other state agencies. And uh, we tried just for purposes of the ease of getting the documentation to stick with mostly with programs that we have direct responsibility for. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit then about our journey through the standards and where, what we ended up with. And so standard 6.2 is educate on the laws and Leah went through that very nicely so we'll skip to the next one. Um, measure 6.2. Point two point one, and what, is, what did we uh, look for when we were uh, developing our evidence? We were looking at the fact that FAB wants to assess our knowledge of how our laws support public health practice and our efforts to assure consistent application. So um, next slide, we, no, you're on the right slide, thank you. Um, 6.2.1, the required documentation one, provision of training for staff and laws to support public health. And in this area, we found that using direct programs that have enforcement um, action were the easiest for us to provide evidence for because it seemed that other public health programs in, the, in our um, division of public health didn't really have a lot of formalized training processes in place for their staff, that they did a lot of informal training, um, having the people read the regulations they were working with and uh, very little in the, in the form of formal training. But in the lead and asbestos programs, we have formal training that just all staff um, have to attend and we had good documentation in place. We were able to provide all of the course materials the, the course manuals and agendas, and the training um, staff records that showed when um, all of our staff had attended. And next slide. The lessons learned in this area is that big time that training must be in the employee's area of responsibility, and I think Leah mentioned that as well. Uh, we tried initially to use evidence of a uh, 
standard privacy and security laws for patient health care, um, keeping uh, personal information private and health care information private and that all of our staff have to attend annually. And that was not considered when we got our first feedback from FAB. They said it was outside of scope. So we had to go back and um, pull additional information from our programs that was more specific to uh, employees' direct areas of responsibility. Um, all employee training needs to be documented and even informal, I think that's a lesson learned, is that if you're doing a lot of informal training for staff, at least doc get it documented and have a plan, have a training plan that people must meet um, when they come on board or annually, and, and then document it and save your records. Next slide. Um, in, in the second area of required documentation, the, the FAB wants us to see our efforts to ensure consistent application of public health laws. So in this area, they're looking to see how are we looking at what we're doing and determining um, what, how well we're doing and what needs to be improved. And so we turn to our radiation program, which does a quarterly internal audit of their own inspections, um, and they review how uh, the various inspectors are reviewing the facilities and uh, the materials that they're inspecting and looking at the metrics for violations that they find. And we also used the Lead and Asbestos Program Enforcement Manual, which provides protocols for inspections, and then our enforcement team meeting notes and our annual um, external review from the US EPA on our program, on our enforcement program, showing that we have, that we are reviewed on a regular basis. So uh, the next slide just shows an example of the, the audit form that radioactive materials uses with their inspections and it just lists the inspections. Um, the inspector names are blacked out, but um, they're there and then all of the areas that they are reviewing. Uh, and you don't need to read it in detail, but it's just an example of a log that we hope is uh, very acceptable. And the second slide um, of a piece of evidence is the, uh, just the cover letter from the US EPA showing that they did review our enforcement files and what their major findings were. It's also important to note that the dates are on these and dates are very important to have for FAB. Um, the next slide, we'll talk about um, lessons learned in this area. And basically, we learned that FAB wants evidence of coordination with other agencies that apply laws. And if we did this again, we might want to look at any work that we had with local health departments. In other words, um, pushing down, are we reviewing what the local health departments are doing? In this case, we used a co cooperation and coordination with the, with the US EPA as evidence. And we'll see how that goes. Um, also, document any joint inspections that your staff may do with other levels of government. And we do a lot of joint inspections with local health departments, with the Department of Natural Resources, um, but we don't do a really good job of documenting that when those are happening and keeping a log. And I think in future that's something we'll look to do. Um, the next uh, measure, 6.2.2, and what is it looking for? It's looking for making information accessible to the public about our licensing, certification, and permitting. And this was pretty easy for us in terms of the, the example for um, required documentation one because we just used our website. The department website on its homepage, and you can flip to the next slide and show that the next one, um, is just a picture of uh, the home page with uh, the menu drop down for certification licensing and permits. And it shows that um, people can click on the various types of um, licenses that are available and including environmental certification 
licenses and permits, which is in public health. So if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that we have on our website just detailed information about the uh, asbestos inspector in this case. This is one example um, that shows what the fees are and what a person has to do to get certified. It's important to note that our contact information is there, that uh, links to the um, statutes and the code, the state code are there, and to our other websites, the, the actual asbestos website. And at the very bottom, um, you'll see where it, it says last reviewed June 2 of 2015, and that's important so that FAB can tell it was within, that it's been updated within the um, time frame that they allow. So um, next slide. Measure 6.2.3 and uh, what is it looking for in terms of educating on the laws? It's looking to assess um, our provision of outreach and education to, the, to people who are regulated entities and who need to comply with the law. So in the next slide, um, this is the provision of information or education to regulated entities on their responsibilities for compliance. And we chose an example here that included metrics and outcome measures. We felt that was important to show that, that, we are, that we're looking for um, areas of outreach where we can actually see if we are making a difference, if we're making an impact. And so we did a summer internship um, project with um, a young woman who did an advertisement review for us and she reviewed companies that were advertising doing uh, renovation work in the state, um, such as house painting, uh, window replacement, roofing siding, and other general remodeling. And she focused on five of the largest uh, urban areas in Wisconsin. She developed a spreadsheet which listed all of the companies that she found, and she then looked them all up in our database to determine if they were licensed or not properly. And then we sent letters out to, the, to these companies that were found to not be licensed. Bottom line was we found that we in Increase for the people or the companies that we reviewed. Um, initially, 8% of the 700 and almost 800 companies uh, we reviewed, 8% uh, were in compliance at that time, only 8%. And we were able to increase that to 15% um, at the end of the project. So it, it had some impact, but it was a lot of, it was also a lot of intense work to do. But this, we tried to show that this. Um, case where we were reaching out to people who were hard to reach um, and trying to bring them information and education on what did they needed to know about being certified. The next slide just shows um, the SOP or the standard operating procedures for doing the cross-check advertisement project. And that was one of the pieces of evidence we provided. Um, next slide. 6.2.3 lessons learned. Um, we learned that having outcome measures can't hurt. Um, we, we felt that this uh, went well with quality improvement, with um, um, program management and, and measurements. So we wanted to show that we, we do, do that on a regular basis. Um, we chose an example of attempting to reach some of our hardest to reach groups, people who aren't normally in larger organizations and, and don't have uh, any kind of an association, for instance, that they're associated with. And in this case, we also felt that it allowed us a real good opportunity to tell a story with our example of what we did. So be sure to have clear documentation of what and how you do compliance information um, provision of it and that, um, that, you in, that you document when it was provided, specifically who to whom it was provided. And don't be afraid to think outside the box with your efforts. Um, so the next area, the next standard that we'll talk about is enforce laws and 
Um, this one covers how the health department enforces laws and communicates about the enforcement. This one has five measures, so it has a lot of um, areas to cover. And the first one is looking at having clear written standards for consistent enforcement. And next slide. The first one is probably the easiest one, which is just showing that we have authority to conduct enforcement. And we simply used two of our statutes, our state statute, Chapter 250, on um, health administration and supervision, and Chapter 252, communicable disease. So we provided, next slide, um, we just provided full copies of both of those and uh, highlighting the powers and duties sections. Next slide. Um, the next area is 6.3.1, and this is required documentation to procedures and protocols for achieving compliance. So this is where FAB wants to know that we have written um, procedures and protocols. And we used uh, one example, our Wisconsin School Immunization Requirements Manual, which is provided to schools every year, and it gives the schools the protocols they need to follow in order to meet the state standards for immunization. And then example two was uh, the Wisconsin Lead and Asbestos Enforcement Policy Manual that has protocols in place for staff in, within the state program for conducting um, inspections and enforcement activities. The next slide shows um, measure 6.3.2, and it's looking for whether we follow requirements for frequency of in inspections. And this was a very hard uh, measure for us to deal with in Wisconsin because many of our um, inspections are really not set out on a, on a strict frequency basis and are really more of a, um, a catch when you can, a moving target of contractors out doing work and uh, different tar uh, contractors in different locations at different times. So you, have, you don't have a stand a standalone business that's in um, operating in the same location 365 days a year, you have a contractor moving around doing various types of work in various locations and you have hundreds or thousands of those contractors in the state. So we found that, that we had a limited pool from which to, to pull and in our state we are not the agency that does restaurant, for instance, restaurant inspections, so we couldn't just turn to our restaurant program to pull this information. Um, so um, if we go to the next slide, we'll look at the examples we did come up with. We came up with our lead programs training accreditation audit requirements, which do requirement, require a newly um, approved or accredited training provider for lead courses to be audited within the first two years in order to become fully approved. And um, this is a frequency, although it's, it's a one-time frequency, but we hope that, that we'll get at least partial, um, uh, partial credit for that. And then the second one was our mammography facilities program, our inspection program, which does have an annual requirement. So uh, that one was a little bit better. Um, the next slide is about uh, the second required documentation for this measure, and that's the, that inspections meet defined frequencies, and they include the actions, status, follow-up, reinspections, and final disposition. So this is really looking at how do we track our in, the inspections that we do, and how do we log them. So we used our lead program course audit um, log, and um, showing that what courses have been audited, within what time frame, and what was the outcome. And then the same with the mammography program. So that one was not too hard. Once we came up with the previous um, required documentation, this one was easier. Next slide is lessons learned, and that would be that not all enforcement programs lend themselves to inspections that meet defined frequencies, and this creates challenges. 
and that logs should provide um, everything that you possibly can. We had to upgrade a couple of our logs um, to be sure that they were showing the reinspections and the final dispositions because they, we weren't always going back and filling those things, um, actually including those in our logs. So we upgraded our um, processes. And then the next measure, 6.3.3, is looking at routine and complaint enforcement activities and, and if we're implementing our protocols properly. And in this case, we had two examples if you want to go to the next slide. We used our vaccines for children's program um, site uh, visit and compliance log and follow up and that included their program policies and procedures. And we used our lead and asbestos enforcement manual complaint log and database pages that show uh, complete complaint investigation and outcome. And next slide. Um, we, this slide also uses the same programs for evidence and this is that we communicate with the regulated entities regarding a complaint or compliance plan. So the vaccines for children, we, we used a letter um, and a summary report um, of a site visit that showed uh, what deficiencies they, that were found and, and the compliance plan for moving forward. And then we used a, a letter of noncompliance for lead safe renovation violations for the second one. The next slide, lessons learned is track your complaints and other emergency enforcement activities and detailed logs. Um, and separately perhaps from your other inspections so that it, they're easy to find and easy to track. And then maintain a detailed enforcement manual that provides all of your standardized policies and procedures. Next, um, measure 6.3.4 is looking at our tracking of trends and compliance based on our enforcement actions taken. So are we looking for trends and are we looking um, for the um, issues around compliance and what we're finding. So in this case, we used our annual reports for the lead program and our annual reports for the asbestos program. And in both cases, we summarized, um, these reports summarize our inspection, enforcement, and complaint activities, and they do provide trends over time. We actually provided, um, I believe, 2015 and 2016 annual reports so they could see that we could track trends um, across, across years. Next slide is the uh, required documentation too, which is debrie debriefings or other evaluations on enforcement. And in this case, um, I, it became important that we had uh, formalized debriefing methods and in particular, uh, we use strat inspection strategy meetings that we keep notes on and we review our inspections, uh, we re review the, the entities that we inspect and the types of uh, actions and, and enforcement actions that we take. And the next slide shows that we can track and show FAB that we do this on a regular basis and that um, this is not something we just throw together for them, but that this is our standard procedure. And the next slide is uh, the lessons learned. Is do annual enforcement program reports, whether they're required or not. If you're working through other agencies, ask that they provide you with, with their annual reports and compare the data and findings across years. And then hold and document regular enforcement team meetings if you do have enforcement programs that review and evaluate regularly um, your policies and protocols and also um, your activities. Next slide. The last measure, finally, um, 6.3.5, and, and I'll be done in a couple minutes, I hope, is assessing our communications and coordination with other agencies and uh, providing information to the public on enforcement activities. And so there are three um, required documentations for this measure, if you go to the next slide. Um, and the first one is, are we do we have a communication protocol for interagency notifications? Are we, are we working with other agencies? And in this case, we used, two, um, we used an example of uh, 
an MOU with the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection, which has the restaurant, food, um, lodging, and recreational facilities program, um, and how we cooperate and coordinate with them when there are, especially when there are outbreaks of disease in in these facilities, and um, also used in our enforcement manual. Um, showing that we have interagency notifications and communications protocols within the lead and asbestos programs. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of, the, of parts of the memorandum of understanding and one of the big things we know is needed is that you must have that signature page that also has the dates on it so they, that FAB knows that this is current and in use. Next slide. A second uh, required documentation is that you have a protocol for notification of the public. And so this, they're looking for written protocols and we provided one from our um, youth tobacco sales um, program and we used and one from our lead and asbestos enforcement actions and showed that we have uh, protocols for notifying the public. And the next page shows um, this is the protocol for the Preventing Youth Access to Tobacco program in Wisconsin. And it shows um, that there's a requirement to uh, educate retailers and reach out to the media and provide information. And the next slide is um, the last uh, required documentation. And this is that you actually do those notifications that you have protocols for. So in this case, we use an example from the um, tobacco program for, that showed regional press releases um, and statewide compliance data being provided. And the second example was uh, our outreach log from the asbestos and lead program. And it showed two of our PowerPoint presentations that we used with various groups um, to provide overviews of our enforcement program and uh, enforcement cases. So this is a slide that's up now is just an example of the um, press release that was provided for youth tobacco and it shows that they gave data on compliance rates in various counties in the state. And the next slide is uh, just the front cover pages and a couple of photos out of um, two of our, pro, our PowerPoint presentations about lead and asbestos enforcement. And I think if you go to the next slide, the lessons learned, thank you, um, is that there may or may not be department-wide policies and procedures in place and you may need to um, work with individual programs to find these protocols. That's what we had to do. And don't be afraid to pull information from what your partners are doing at the local level or at other levels of state government and include their data, especially if the state program shares um, statewide data. And the next slide, I think, is the last. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much, Shelley, for walking us through that. You provided so many great examples and especially liked how you um, provided images of that and showed really um, you know, what this was an example of, highlighting every area of importance, the title, the date, the partners if they were involved, and that really gets at, um, you know, what FAB is looking for and how it meets those requirements. So thank you so much for sharing those with us. And now we'd like to move on to partnerships for public health enforcement. We'll hear from Don Hunter, the Deputy Cabinet Secretary from the New Mexico Department of Health. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, participate in the webinar today. I hope this information will be helpful to folks who are going through accreditation or maybe are already accredited and currently going through the reaccreditation process. Um, I will say also I appreciate Shelley's presentation because many of the lessons learned um, are things that we also experienced here in New Mexico. Um, the difference uh, in my presentation is that here we are already accredited. We were accredited in 2015 and we're currently going through a reaccreditation process. Uh, the Department of Health is completely centralized in New Mexico, so we don't have local public health offices or, or boards of health here. We don't have a state board of health either. And so everything is really coordinated at the state level. Um, so what we're going to cover today, 
is how uh, at the agency we approach standard 6.3, um, what you need to know if enforcement falls under other jurisdictions, which is probably pretty common in some areas, whether you're centralized or not. Um, and then documentation examples if you do not have the authority to enforce public health laws, which was an extensive amount of the documentation that we had to submit. And then I'll talk about what we're doing um, as we work toward reaccreditation. So I like to include this slide just as a reminder of how the work that we do fits in with the um, essential public health services. And uh, we actually had an effort to update our Public Health Act to make sure that the powers and responsibilities or powers and duties of the department reflect the essential health services, one of which is, of course, enforce laws and regulations that protect health and ensure safety. So I included this slide um, just to note to everyone that uh, the New Mexico Department of Health was accredited under standards and measures ver version 1.0. And I put up here a couple of quotes that were really important that guided the work that we did when looking at standard 6.3, um, which is when other state agencies, local departments, or levels of government have enforcement authority, the role of the health department is to collaborate, assist, and share information. We found here at the Department of Health that really that's exactly what we were doing. We were collaborating, we were assisting, and we were sharing information, but we weren't really doing a lot of the other uh, enforcement activities. The second important quote was, the health department is responsible for follow-up communication and education on public health impacts and protection. One of the things that we found during this process is that even if we were in communication and collaborating with other agencies on public health activities, that we realized maybe that there were some gaps in terms of how we were then communicating with the public or with important stakeholders about the impacts of enforcement activities and educating um, the public on our uh, public health initiatives. So Leah covered this, um, so I won't go into detail, but this is just kind of how we looked, you know, summarizing, keeping in mind what kind of things you have to demonstrate. And uh, it, is it good to note that these requirements are not significantly different in version 1.5, um, with the added bonus that there's a little bit more clarity about the types of documentation and options in terms of documentation or narratives, which I think is a great change in the current version. So. Um, this is how we initially approached standard 6.3. I think when I joined the department, we were actually going through the accreditation process, and um, I was assigned to work on domain six. And basically, um, we really didn't have a sense of what we were going to provide, how we would collect it, who was responsible for the information, or anything. So there are a lot of people who were involved in the process, and we were all kind of uh, moving through the process blindly until we figured out a strategy to identify what we needed to submit. The reason why this was challenging at first for us is that we as an agency have limited enforcement authority, and um, we find that we collaborate frequently with other agencies, but importantly, we did not have a lot of formal agreements or protocols in place. Um, if we did have an agreement or protocol in place, we didn't have documentation necessarily of that. And the information that we did exist, we weren't really reviewing it in any systematic way, and it wasn't centralized. So we were having to um, contact lots of different people throughout the department to collect documentation and then spend a lot of time reviewing it for its appropriateness for submission. So then what we did is um, we did a couple of things. One is identify a point person. For us here, that was me at the time. I was a public health law fellow. I was actually in the same cohort as Leah. And um, I was assigned to work on Domain 6 um, as part of our accreditation efforts. We also had one of our assistant general counsels assigned to work on the accreditation uh, process with us. And so we decided to develop a, a, an approach, basically, to how we would identify and collect information. So we had several meetings where we went through the standards and measures and what was being requested for documentation and came up with a list of the types of documentation we thought would meet the requirements, and also who would be responsible for providing the information. We also set some very clear timelines, and um, we decided to get feedback. So we did hire a consultant um, also here in New Mexico in preparation for our site visit. So we worked with a consultant well in advance to review the types of documents we were proposing to submit. That was really critical, and I thought, um, from my perspective, we were very well prepared for our site visit. 
I would even say we might have been overprepared. Um, some of our important partners in the state here are the Department of Transportation, uh, Public Education Department, Aging and Long-Term Services and Environment. I didn't put the logo for Human Services, but the Human Services Department is also an important partner. There are state Medicaid agency that is not housed in the Department of Health here. And internally, this is just a, a nutshell, but the immunization program, our state laboratory, our TB program, and our Office of Injury Prevention are just a few of the examples of um, people who are involved in public health enforcement activities. So as an agency, what we have enforcement authority over are things like notifiable conditions, immunizations, uh, testing related to food and waterborne outbreaks, importantly, of course, isolation and quarantine, and certain activities related to STIs. But as a few examples of how our partners are important, seat belts and motor vehicle safety issues are conducted um, and enforcement activities are conducted in partnership with the Department of Transportation. Our Environment Department is responsible for enforcement around food establishments, drinking water, and, and other uh, environmental health issues. Vector control here in the state, as in many states, is through local entities. Um, even our immunization activity is something that is conducted in partnership with the Public Education Department. And emergency response from a public health perspective includes all of these partner here, all the partners listed here, and many others. So on our initial submission, um, a couple of examples of what was accepted are listed here. This is not an extensive list, but our TB program was really important in terms of their annual review and their cohort review of cases. We also submitted um, an agreement we have with the Albuquerque International Sunport, our airport here, um, on a communicable disease emergency response plan that also includes some important partners, and an MOA that we have um, with Texas uh, for non-compliant TB patients. So there were lots of things that were not accepted. We collected, I think, 700, somewhere in the 700 range, somewhere between six and 800 documents um, that we reviewed in uh, anticipation of submission and probably close to that in terms of what we submitted. The kinds of things that were not accepted were statutes, regulations, and protocols that were out of date or did not have a date. Um, so it's important uh, to check when laws and regulations were last updated and also to put them on a regular review cycle. I discussed this a little bit during webinar two. Uh, for example, we at the Department of Health in New Mexico are currently establishing a regular review cycle for all regulations that the department is responsible for. We also uh, made significant updates here to the Public Health Act in 2017, and that was the result of a systematic review of our public health laws using the Model State Public Health Act. So that's a document that we could potentially submit this year um, to demonstrate our um, meeting the requirements in Domain 6 across 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. So uh, we were put on an action plan. We had our site visit in December of 2014. Uh, we received our action plan in March of 2015, which basically means that an accreditation decision has been deferred uh, until some more work is done and additional documentation is submitted. What we did when we got our action plan is we immediately established an action plan work group and eventually submitted our action plan in July of 2015, and then we were accredited in November of 2015. That work group consisted of um, a, a handful of key partners from throughout the department. I continued to be involved in that. We had our state epidemiologist um, and some folks from our epidemiology and response division who were involved. Our public health division was largely involved. And we had one of our attorneys continue to, be, to participate in that work group, as well as um, some individuals from our policy office. And I should mention that our Office of Policy and Accountability actually is where our accreditation coordinator is housed. And so all of our accreditation work is facilitated out of that office, but with key staff members throughout the agency. So our action plan was interesting. We had two things basically, I think, in domains one and two, but our biggest gaps were in domain six and almost exclusively in 6.3. <laughs> so. Um, this is just a summary of what those were, procedures and protocols, inspection schedules, actions taken in response to complaints, patterns or trends in compliance, and coordinated notification regarding enforcement activities. So what we did when we got our action plan is we did an assessment of our feedback from the site visit. So this is just a screenshot of um, what we developed to track what we were being asked to do. 
So in the, in the far left column, it starts out with the measure. Uh, the next column shows the documents that we provided, and in red are the documents that were not accepted. And then in the middle column there, or the large column, site visit report findings, um, basically is the feedback that we received on the documentation. Um, we then follow it with a column related to actions that we were required to take. In this case, the, the number of examples um, was not met because some of our, do our documentation was inadequate. And we included in that a list of possible documents that could be satisfactory. Uh, we identified division leads and we identified deadlines uh, for when we wanted to uh, submit the updated documentation. So from our perspective, it was really important to, we decided to have a very aggressive timeline in terms of responding to our action plan. We wanted to, our, our initial thought was that we wanted to get on the first available board uh, meeting agenda after we were ready. And so um, this is just a summary of what our plan was. We got our action plan in March and we wanted to submit um, by May and be accredited or get an accreditation decision in June. Went a little bit later than that, which was fine. Um, but we were prepared and we had all of our documentation collected um, pretty early on and we did some revisions throughout uh, up until the end of June of 2015. So the other thing that we did is we used that uh, initial site visit assessment and proposed documents to actually start to flesh that out. So as our, um, as our action plan work group continued to meet, we started to really hone in on what documents we wanted to submit and if those documents didn't exist, what our progress was on, uh, on creating them or ensuring that we had some kind of response. So we also had a tracking document that looked like this for, do for domains one and two and six for our action plan, um, identifying the responsible party, the measure, the document title, and updates. And we updated this tracker regularly until all of the documentation was complete. The other thing that we did is we broke down each of the standards in more detail and provided regular updates and we continued to do this even after we submitted our action plan because we felt that a lot of the work that we were doing was important as a continuous quality improvement approach for the department, that the things that we were doing were not just for the purposes of being accredited but because we really value process improvement and um, demonstrating how we as an agency can operate efficient, efficiently and perform at a high standard. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about some of the documentation that was accepted ultimately. Um, and it was a challenge throughout just really trying to identify what we could do, but I think in the end we were largely su successful. So for 6.3.1, procedures and protocols, uh, for conducting enforcement actions. This one ended up being fully demonstrated. You see here a list of the things that we submitted um, as examples. Um, they do a couple of things. So these documents establish the use of agency resources to identify and regulate hazardous workplaces. Our environment department is responsible for establishing and enforcing regulations and providing training and education related to um, occupational safety and health. Um, on the Department of Health side, we uh, occupational illness and injuries are a notifiable condition. So we just try to establish that we have regular communication and partnership with NMED, our environment department, um, on occupational safety issues. Uh, other documents that we submitted also established agency roles in food board outbreak investigations. So the Department of Health is responsible for investigating outbreaks and the environment depart uh, department is responsible for um, for investigation of facilities that prepare food, and so we partner with them. We had, at the time, an existing protocols regarding foodborne illness outbreaks, but we didn't have any formal agreements in place um, regarding the work that we were doing. So that's something that we addressed as part of our action plan. For 6.3.2, inspection schedule or algorithm, this one also ended up being fully demonstrated, and this uh, here is a list of the documents that were accepted. The Department of Health here has a statutory authority to investigate, control, and debate the causes of disease. And our environmentalists here have a role in the investigation piece, which is something that was covered in the submitted procedures and in the MOA that we established with the Environment Department. Um, this ties into the previous slide as well, but as part of our action plan I mentioned, we were able to really formalize this process. And what we put in place and that we have continued going forward is that we share reports with the Environment Department on reported illnesses 
if one or more individuals and establishments that they regulate, and they agreed to send us back the steps they take on every report they get. So for 6.3.3, actions um, taken in response to complaints, this was largely demonstrated, and we submitted a whole lot of documentation, and this is not even the full list of what was submitted, and it still wasn't fully demonstrated, but largely, so we were, we were excited about that. A couple of things to note, um, the protocols that we did submit were not dated. So you heard it in the previous presentation, say it here, make sure things are dated, uh, make sure you have your logos on them. It's very clear you know, that the communication comes from the responsible agency and when it went out. Um, another thing of note is that our uh, public education department is responsible for pursuing action against schools that have non-compliant students. Um, this is about immunizations. And the Department of Health uh, is responsible for auditing schools that are identified as non-compliant. So we were able to demonstrate where the authority existed between the two agencies, but one thing we did not do is provide examples of our own follow-up with non-compliant schools. So that's a process that we've continued to work on and develop um, since we submitted our action plan. We also were able to establish more clearly the roles and responsibilities in interagency communication on foodborne illness. So we submitted very similar or the same documentation um, across these standards. And again, this process was developed and, Im developed and implemented thanks to working on accreditation. Um, not on this list, but we also had documentation that was accepted related to our agreement between the state laboratory in the Department of Health and the Environment Department for drinking water microbiology on-site evaluation and report expectations. With uh, that, we also sent an example of a letter sent to a town with findings from an audit and the restrictions that were put in place. So those met the requirements. For 6.3.4, patterns or trends in compliance, this one was probably the most difficult measure for us to demonstrate. It was also the one that we probably spent the most time trying to figure out what we could do. Um, ultimately, you see here we submitted four key documents. Only one of them was accepted, and that was the Traffic Safety Annual Report. That was accepted because the Department of Health is listed in the report as a traffic safety planning partner, and that was clear. Also, the report identified data on traffic-related injuries and fatalities, performance measures and targets, legislative activities, education campaigns, prevention projects, and other state resources. So that document met all of the requirements. The other documents that we submitted that have the red X's next to them did not have a public or public population health implication. In the case of WIC, that report focused on procedural and policy issues rather than health, so it was not accepted. And we received similar feedback for the Office of the Secretary Complaint Annual Report. We receive, um, we have a centralized way of reviewing constituent complaints, and we review and summarize them on a quarterly basis, and we also follow up individually with constituents um, on the action taken. This report, however, was noted as being too broad-based and targeted at the agency as a whole, again, not really having the public or population health implication. Uh, it was also noted in our review that some of the documentation submitted failed to identify process improvements, even if issues with noncompliance were noted. So that's a, an area of uh, opportunity for us as we move toward reaccreditation. And then lastly on this slide, 6.3.5, coordinated notification regarding enforcement activities. This ended up being fully demonstrated. What we submitted was a newly developed communication protocol that very clearly identified how and when information is shared with the public regarding nursing home surveys. We were also able to demonstrate an agreement with uh, the Environment Department to communicate with the Department of Health Occupational Health Surveillance Program. So this also was used in one of the other measures. One thing I will note, um, oh, and it, before I move on, we also submitted a joint protocol that we had established between the Department of Health, our Human Services Department, and our Aging um, and Long-Term Services Department regarding how each agency is involved in the health and safety of individuals in health facilities. So in terms of documentation that was one, not accepted, I will make a note that uh, one of the things we found is that med, uh, documentation related to our medical cannabis program, our developmental disability uh, waiver supports, our developmental disability supports division, and to some extent, some of our health facilities information was not accepted as being regulated by other entities. So that's something really important to keep in mind even though it's a critical part of our health department and we try to advocate for documentation being accepted um, because it is something that we, a, a role that we perform, uh, it was not accepted at the time. 
So as I mentioned, we are in the process of reaccreditation, and we have an accreditation sustainability plan. That plan describes the accredited status and the reaccreditation process for the next five years for the department, um, so through 2020 for us here. It is a living document, and I think I'm, I'm toward the end, so I think I'm close to time, but uh, the accreditation coordinator, which I had mentioned is housed in our policy office, determines the level of detail that's provided in the plan with input from the accreditation support team. The plan that we developed identifies roles and responsibilities, a maintenance timeline, guidelines for document submission, and marketing and promotion activities. Uh, it also, to some extent, identifies previous documentation that was submitted. Our public health accreditation leadership team, or FALT, provides subject matter expertise and general guidance and support to the coordinator and to our accreditation champions. This group is composed of members of leadership within the agency, and so that also has a role in addressing organizational constraints or obstacles, and in promoting reaccreditation throughout the department. Our FALT team also reviews and approves previously um, submitted documents for reaccreditation. And finally, our accreditation champions develop, facilitate, and monitor a work plan that guides their division toward reaccreditation. So these are folks from within our, um, we have eight program areas in the department um, or divisions. And they serve as subject matter experts for their division. They also serve as the document provider, and they develop and or collect the documentation. They submit it for review um, and make sure that it's uh, in our SharePoint document library. This group meets monthly and has, also has a role in connecting to other initiatives throughout the department um, including our quality improvement initiatives. And what you see here on the table is we have a review schedule that we set for each month the corresponding domain. So we actually just finished reviewing domain five, and this webinar is timely. We'll be reviewing domain six in June. Um, this is just a snapshot of what our reaccreditation tracking guide looks like. It follows version um, 1.5 of the standards and measures and indicates whether a narrative, examples, or plan are required, and basically indicates the requirements, what the guidance is, who's responsible, who our um, fault team lead is, who our accreditation champion is, and when the final version is due. This exists for each domain, and we also, in our sustainability plan, have a separate tracking timeline and breakdown um, for what is due by each standard and measure by year and by division leading up to 2020. And um, what you see here is just the first page of Domain 6. So on a final note, um, working with tribal partners, New Mexico, we have 23 federally recognized tribes, pueblos, or nations. We have a State Tribal Collaboration Act that formalizes our relationship with tribal partners. As part of that act, we are required to issue an annual agency report, and we're also are required to have a communication policy. So we have a consultation, collaboration, and communication policy here at the Department of Health. Um, accepted documentation that we submitted that's relevant to work with uh, other agencies was largely related to our tuberculosis program. So uh, I mentioned that we have an MOA with Texas um, where we can send non-compliant TB patients because we don't have facilities here. Um, we also have an MOU uh, with the Alamo, Navajo Nation, or the Alamo Navajo School Board, and as part of the documentation that was accepted, we submitted a Navajo Nation court order from the Judicial, Judicial District of Alamo for a non-compliant TB patient. Um, and then finally, I will note that our Public Health Emergency Response Act, which we also submitted and was accepted, allows us to enter into MOUs with tribal entities. So those are just some examples of how you can demonstrate your work with tribal communities or tribal partners. So my final thoughts are um, that if you are not centralized, local and tribal health departments um, may have some of this documentation. If you, um, and even if you are, they, there may be partners who have documentation that are relevant that you have worked with, especially for us in our public health offices, um, the work that we do in the community. So not just domain six, but really in other domains. Um, please consider formalizing your protocols and agreements with other agencies and departments. We found that we're really doing a lot of the things that we were being asked to demonstrate, and we didn't really have anything to prove that. Um, develop a tracking plan and regularly collect and review the proposed documentation. That's what we're doing now, and I think that we have a, a pretty good process in place. And I think it's something to consider if you don't have it in place already, put it in place. Um, be ready to address the gaps that exist. Uh, for us, Domain 6 was um, one that we, I think we put off until the end. It was easy to collect documentation for all the other domains. And we got to Domain 6 and we found ourselves kind of scrambling to pull things together. 
And then, of course, ask for feedback from your accreditation specialist, or if you um, hire a consultant, work with your consultant to review things before your site visit. So I just want to say thank you again. I'm really honored to present on behalf of the department. I know we're close to maybe right over time. Um, this is just a screenshot of the cover of our accreditation sustainability plan. To give a lot of credit to our former accreditation coordinator, Christina Perea, for her work on this and for the whole team and the policy office for continuing to move our accreditation work forward. So thank you. Thank you, Dawn. That was incredibly helpful information. Um, a lot of final thoughts, must, um, a lot of helpful information, especially in those final thoughts. So thank you so much for taking the time to present that information. And with that, that now marks our time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions for any of the presenters, please feel free to use the chat box now to enter that in. I have received a few already, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, but again, please, if you have additional questions, use the chat box feature to pose those to our presenters. So my first question is for Dawn. So Don, you mentioned performance improvement as part of one of the reasons why your one of your examples did not meet FAB's requirements. So with that, has the agency moved more towards including performance improvement as part of their their work in this arena? And if so, how? Yeah, so one of the things I'll say is that over the last couple of years, kind of in parallel to accreditation, is that we have formalized our performance management system and we have reestablished a quality improvement council and so we're really trying to move toward you know a formalized performance management system in the in the agency that really focuses on process improvement at all levels throughout the department um, specific to this domain one example would be we really looked at how we can improve process for example around policies and regulations we did not have any system in place to to track or update them on any kind of regular basis or review them or even identify who's responsible for them. We put that system in place. Um, we've uh, increased uh, the percentage of policies that we have in the department that are compliant with certain standards that we have established. And right now we're working on um, compiling and identifying all the rules that the agency is responsible for uh, and identifying a timeline for a review of those. So I think that has really helped to inform our work and how we continually assess particularly laws and regulations and the policies that we um, are responsible for and how we make improvements and document those over time. Oh yes, very, a lot of, a lot of performance improvement, great work going on there, wow, thank you. All right, I have another question, this time for Shelly. So Shelly, as part of a, more of a programmatic team as opposed to being um, on the um, involved 100% on policy, did your involvement in Domain 6 lead to any changes at the agency? For example, were you working more closely with other departments, agency leadership, or even state policymakers? And um, the second part of that question is, what other additional changes did going through this process have on your, your specific program area? Um, thank you. Um, well, you, you know, we're still in the process, so some of the things that we'll probably end up uh, looking at closely for future um, work will come out as we go, as we get more feedback from FAB. But uh, in the meantime, I think we obviously identified several areas of, of weakness that kind of mirror the things that Don was saying in terms of having formalized relationships with other um, agencies, whether it's local health departments or other state agencies. We have, I believe, really close uh, working relationships with, with several other um, state agencies and programs as well as local health departments, but we don't have as many um, or appropriate um, memos of understanding or MOAs um, with these agencies that really lay out um, how our relationship works. And the same would, could be said with our state lab. And so um, really formalizing that process a little bit more. We have some MOUs, but we certainly um, have identified areas where we need more. Um, the same with annual reports for my program specifically. Um, we always have done annual reports for the LED program. We're on a federal grant, and we um, have to do an annual report for, for that purpose every year anyway. 
but we have added doing them regularly for our asbestos program as well, which isn't under a federal grant, and uh, we see the value of systematically looking at our data and looking at trends and um, how the program is working. So those are two areas. Um, we don't know yet what all the gaps are going to be when FAB um, provides us with their feedback. I think when we know some of the gaps, that will help us identify more clearly areas that we might want to focus on. I don't know if that answered or not, if, if there's Great, anything thank else you, Don. would want to or, know. Shelly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, Shelly. Yep, sorry, I was just getting ready to, I was it's reading okay. my, my next question for Don. Sorry about that, Shelly. Yes, okay. Yep, very, very helpful and excited to possibly, or hopefully hear kind of what changes you all have maybe in a, a year or two after you are credited for some time. Exactly. Well, maybe we'll do a, a round two. <laughs> all right, I have another question for Don. Um, so, Don, you talked a lot about MOUs with other entities. How did you go about establishing those relationships? Were they a result of accreditation, or did they did you have them in place beforehand? We uh, largely had those relationships in place beforehand. In the case of environment, we already had a lot of existing agreements with our state laboratory, um, which is responsible for a lot of the, uh, if not most of the testing for environment. And so we already had connections in place. We also happen to be in the same building. Uh, fun fact, the Department of Health and Environment used to be a single department here. Now we're still in the same building, but we're two separate departments. So, um, so we already had those connections, but I would say what we had is we had um, our state epidemiologist who works with um, the occupational health folks and uh, some of the environmental um, uh, health people. And he reached out to some of his partners in the environment department. We also had our general counsel um, connect with their general counsel in terms of uh, forming, drafting the agreements and reviewing them. And we worked on them together as an agency, and then our Office of the Secretary was involved in the final review of those agreements. Thank you, Don. And then one more question for you, and this is more about a couple of pieces you touched on. So. Um, we have folks interested in um, your consultation, collaboration, and communication policy with tribes. Is that something that's available online? Or is it available anywhere that um, others could possibly take a look at it? I believe it is on our, um, our website. I can check and provide the link. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's there. So we have a page for the Office of the Tribal Liaison. Um, our <laughs> tribal liaison is Ico Allen, and our State Tribal Collaboration Act actually requires that all state agencies have a tribal liaison, and so she maintains that information. And so if you go to nmhealth.org and, um, and search for Office of the Tribal Liaison, or you can even, I think, search for that policy, it should come up under publications or documents. Great, thank you. And then also, same goes for your accreditation sustainability plan. Is that something that's available online or that you all would be willing to share? We are willing to share and um, are happy to answer questions about it and our process um, for developing it. Great. And how might somebody go about um, requesting that sustainability plan? We have folks on the on the chat box that would like to see that. Could they, I, you, I know you provided your email address, so could they just reach out to you for that? Or we can certainly, if um, okay with you all, all over New Mexico, post it, um, post it online and share that link as well, or make it a resource connected to this webinar series. So the, yeah, the first thing I'll do is verify um, that we have the final version available. And then the next thing I would say is that um, our, direct, our deputy director in the Office of Policy and Accountability, uh, Martin Brown, is a good contact. You can follow up with him. We're currently in the process of hiring a new accreditation coordinator, so ultimately it would be that person. In the meantime, you can contact Mr. Brown, and um, he's excellent and will help you with that. And I can great, provide thank you. information. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. 
All right, we just have a couple of uh, minutes left, and I have a question actually for Leah, so more around support that ASTO might be able to provide in this arena. So um, Leah, does ASTO or do you know of any other organizations um, that can offer any support to states on the components covered in Domain 6? Uh, yeah, so at ASTO, uh, our team, our performance improvement team that works with states, territories, and freely associated states on accreditation, quality improvement, and performance management, um, we have a technical assistance opportunity currently. We are um, in our next application for grant and funding opportunities from CDC. We'll be proposing to have this again. Um, but we do have a technical assistance opportunity where we provide technical assistance to states um, in a number of different areas, and, and of course, this is an area that we could help with. Uh, we do also have an accreditation library where we collect documentation from states who are going through the accreditation process, as well as territories and freely associated states, are, so there are less documents from them. Um, but we, we upload those onto our accreditation library, so others at the state, local, tribal, and territorial level can look at those, although they are from states, as we are members of our states um, and, and territories, they should be applicable to other um, levels of government as well. Um, and so if anyone is on the phone currently and if you're a state health agency and would like to share any of your domain six examples that we can post online, please um, reach out to us. I think our contact information um, will be on the final page, um, accreditation at ASTO.org. Um, and we work with you to make sure that all the information is um, accurate before we put that up. We have our state health policy team here at ASTO, so that's KT Kramer and Andy Baker-White. They are great, both attorneys um, who specialize in public health law, um, and so they, they do a lot of work with states and territories as well, um, especially with legislative tracking um, and other uh, work in that area. Uh, probably the team that we see the most uh, doing work around areas in enforcement is our environmental health team. Um, and they, again, work with states and territories. So if you have any specific questions on some of uh, the areas that might fall under enforcement for environmental health, we can connect you with that team. Um, they do a lot of uh, diverse work as well. Um, in terms of other organizations or agencies, um, I'm not sure specifically to domain six, um, but you know there are organizations like the Network for Public Health Law. I know the CDC. Um, public health law program as well. Uh, Matthew Penn presented on our first webinar. They do a lot of legislative tracking um, and legislative epidemiology. So if there are certain policies that you're looking to put into place, um, they are good contacts as well. So please reach out to us. We can we can connect you to the right people, um, pro share examples, um, best practices, and lessons learned that we've learned from other states as well. Great, thank you, Leah. All right, and we are just now about out of time. So we we'll need to conclude our webinar. But once again, I want to thank you all for joining us, um, our participants, the presenters especially, and of course our funders um, for this great presentation, robust discussion, and the questions. And I would like to thank you, uh, or ask you all again to please take a minute to just complete an evaluation at the conclusion of this webinar. Once you exit out, you should um, receive a a link pop up on your screen and we'll also be sending out an email here shortly with the slides as well as another email once the webinar recording is available. Please um, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions, if we can provide any support or connect you to others that might be able to provide this. And Leah mentioned environment, our environmental health team as well as um, our state policy folks, so feel free to reach out to us. With that, thank you all once again. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.